Hello again, everyone. So today what we're going to talk about is the actual like governance and actually expansion of the Mamluks in Egypt and some of the cultural things and trade and economics. So let's just jump right into it. So uh, Baybars, who when last we left was assassinating the previous sultan and becoming a sultan himself, is able to take control and will create the Batri dynasty, which actually lasts until 1380. Two. And what you can see here is massive expansion. I mean, when last we left, um, they the Ayyubids control most of this area, and they kind of right up into here, okay, as well as down here. Well, the Baybars isn't going to control that, but he's going to drive deep into modern-day Iraq, well up into Syria, coming really close to Anatolia. He's going to get rid of all the Crusader states, Pfft, gone, goodbye, uh, drive deep down into Nubia or modern-day Sudan, so that's going to be pretty good as well, and he'll also get rid of those rascally assassins, so we don't have to deal with them anymore. He also is going to establish diplomatic relationships with other empires, and this is how you know you've kind of made it. When other empires are willing to have diplomatic relations and trade and stuff like that, that you're seen as an equal, and that's why it's really, really important. And he will establish relations with like uh, European kingdoms, like the Normans on the island of Sicily, as well as the Mongols over in Persia. So again, we see this expansion in trade and economics. He's going to do a lot to uh, improve the infrastructure, lots of roads, canals, stuff like that. Um, he is going to also work on expanding and training of the military um, really, really expanding the cavalry as well as their archers. And that's something they're going to be really known for at the height of their power. Um, and then he will die a natural death, not assassinated, in 1227. And one of the things he's known for is building this gigantic mosque here as well. All right, so what is the focus of the Mamluk sultans? Well, first and foremost, all about merchants and trade. Of course, Muhammad was a trader, so... We're going to see that theme a lot. Um, maintaining and building mosques, that's going to be really important. Um, as you see there, these are the second and third holiest sites in Islam. The top right is the Prophet of, or sorry, the Mosque of the Prophet. This is where Muhammad is buried in Medina. And on the bottom there is the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. Um, these were kind of under disrepair. And so the Mamluk sultans are really going to expand on them, beautify them, bring them up to code, if you will. And, you know, really, really important. Of course, these are some of the central sites for Muslims to visit today behind Mecca. Um, they are going to build lots of madras schools and hospitals to, again, continue this theme of Islamic knowledge, which we have seen in previous videos. Um, they will hold on to slavery. That's not going to go anywhere. Um, they will also be fighting quite a bit. Um, they'll have periodic battles with the Ilkhanate of Persia, and they're going to need their Mamluk slaves, <laughs> fighters, to continue on. So they're free, but they'll still enslave other people, unfortunately. Um... A governance here is very interesting. So rule is not hereditary. Um, often you have the next sultan approved by high-ranking nobles known as emirs, E-M-I-R-S. Um, and they were descendants of some of the leadership of the Mamluks from the beginning of the empire. Um, they also serve as governors of um, various provinces. Um could, however, a really strong sultan get a son on the throne? Yeah. But sometimes, you know, the emirs were really strong and they would block it. Um, the sultan does have ultimate authority. There is no voting for anything else. Like once he's in power, he rules by decree. So that is ultimate power. Um, the governors would have control of local areas and they also set up something called the uh, uh, Itka system which is basically emirs are given the right to collect revenue from a specific area. And that money was to be used for the military in the region. Um, and then it would also later on serve as income for the emir, but the emir was still expected to do 
infrastructure programs and keeping that military going and trying to improve the economy. So if you were an emir, the trade-off for yes, you get to determine who the sultan is, but you have a lot of responsibility. Um, eventually, they do create a position which is kind of like a right-hand man of the sultan. The sultan ends up kind of running like the big picture stuff and like foreign affairs, and they're going to create something known as the vice regent or the vice regency of Egypt, and that guy is going to be a little bit more responsible for some of the day-to-day -day stuff and as well as the economics. So really, really important position. Their military was outstanding. Um, the Mamluks would still be used for this. Um, they would be loyal to the state, so they were kind of used as a private army of the sultan. And the emirs also had their own armies, but these weren't Mamluk slave armies. They had to raise army from the men in their region in which they governed. Um, and much like today, they used a ranking system, a division system to make the army more efficient. Um, top generals could be awarded. And again, as you see here on the right, cavalry, archery, that's what it's all about. Now, eventually, they will have problems. Uh, first starts in 1399, where Timur, or Tamerlane, invades Syria and sacks Aleppo and Damascus. Um, he actually leaves because he just didn't feel like staying there. Um, but still, it's going to cause them problems. Um, then in 1403, or sorry, then shortly after that, Ottomans take over Anatolia. Um, this is them kind of pushing out the Seljuk Turks and taking control of what is now modern-day Turkey. Then in 1403, they get hit with famines, and actually the plague will hit in 1405, 1415, 1420. Um, Bedouins, the Bedouins periodically revolt as well. Those are um, nomadic tribesmen that live in the desert. And then in the late, in the early 1400s, they're having issues controlling the trade routes through the region. Starting in 1500, they start fighting with the Safavids out of Persia, and that's going to hit them. And then finally, it's going to be pretty simple. Uh, and from 1516 to 1517, the Mamluks will be conquered by the Ottoman Empire under Selim I, and then that's it. They're gone. Now, cultural things. Um, Arabic was the language for administration and education, but the bulk of the people actually talk Turkic. However, Arabic was important to know because it was the language of the um, of the scholars and stuff like that. So if you were going to be part of that group, you had to know Arabic. Um, they are mainly Sunni Islam, which is really, really important. Um, they did allow Sufism, but Sunni Islam was crucial for that unity, which came into play again against the Crusaders, it comes into play against the Mongols, and it was really a way to unify that population. It was really, really important. Um, there were large groups of Coptic Christians and Jews in the empire as well. Jews fared a little bit better. They were able to openly worship and build, build synagogues. Um, the Christians had it harder. It was actually two reasons why Christians had it harder. One, many um, Mongols who they came into contact were were um, Nestorian Christians, so they didn't like that. Um, also, Armenian and Georgian Christians had worked with the Mongols during their invasions, uh, as well as periodic raids, so they don't like that. Um, and the Christians would be persecuted from time to time, sometimes banned from jobs, sometimes not allowed to build places of worship. Um, and the probably the largest group of Christians were in Syria at this time. And because of the discrimination by the Mamluks, many would actually uh, choose to leave Syria because of that. The economy here was agricultural based. If we go all the way back to you know Roman times in Egypt, like there's a lot of stuff that you can grow around the Nile. Um, cotton and sugar are their big ones. Cotton actually really popular, not popular, but really uh, a big money maker in Egypt today. Um, although due to lack of water in the region and the need to like constantly make sure that the 
the irrigation is going, uh, the government pretty much centrally controlled everything. Okay. Uh, so there really wasn't like private farmers and stuff like that. They really didn't do a lot of manufacturing at all. Most of everything was based off of trade. Um, Baybars has trade agreements with Genoa and uh, or Genoa, and they would also go as far out as uh, Ceylon or Sri Lanka. They really serve as the middleman for stuff, and they were big on exporting raw materials. And so as a result, they can make a lot of things. And as you can see here, this map of trade routes of, of the time in the 1300s, you know, there's a, there's a lot of... of area that has to go through here and so a really interesting empire that rises up at this time you know lasts for a, a decent amount of time you know from you can call it 1250 to 1500 so that's a solid run um and another one of these medieval uh islamic empires that was actually able to achieve quite a bit all right guys i hope you enjoyed this one and i'll see you soon